to the book of Acts. We're in chapter 13, where Paul is about to start. He's actually starting his first missionary journey. And this was an, an enormous change. He'd been in Antioch, and things were just exploding in Antioch. Things were going really, really well. There's nobody preaching about Yale there. And so there were all these people coming to Christ, probably thousands of people coming to Christ. And we know historically that that revival, or maybe it was an awakening, might be a better way to call it, better way to put it, that revival was actually going to shape significantly the development of the entire church across the, the Mediterranean basin. So this was a very important event. And so here we have a, a, a blossoming apostle who had been receiving teaching directly from Christ himself. And so God all of a sudden picks him up and moves him. And I'm sure that kind of rattled him a little bit. But the, the cool thing about these guys, the amazing thing about these guys in Antioch is they didn't even blink. They just, they, they knew they were perceiving what the Holy Spirit was telling them to do. He speaks, he leads, he guides, he teaches, and he makes decisions. And Paul and Barnabas are going with me. And they said, okay. And so they prayed, laid hands, and sent him out. So picking up on verse 4, in chapter 13, verse 4, he says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, from where they were sailing to Cyprus. Now, here's Cyprus. This is easy to see, right? Now, they were in Antioch. Now, what's not quite on this map is down here by the coast was a little town, not so really a little town, it was a port city, called Seleucus. It was named after the Seleucids, which was a Greek bunch that had ruled this whole area for some time. Anyway, so they moved there, and they sailed to, to Salamis in Cyprus, just so you know. These are real places. You can go there. Okay. So, <clears throat> when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. That's John Mark. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, that's the other end. See that? It's Paphos. So they just went one end to the other. Where do you want to go, Lord? I don't know. Let's just go down the middle. So they did. Where were we? Okay, I'm sorry. Verse 6, middle of verse 6. They found a magician. So they're in Paphos, and they, they found a magician. A Jewish what? False, False prophet. Whose name was Bar-Jesus. Who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Did you forget the Romans were around? A man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas. That would be Sergius Paulus, and and sought to hear them, hear from them the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But this this is now we got a conflict. Now we got a conflict between light and dark. But Saul, who is also known as Paul, so this is the first we hear that his name has changed, and just so you know. Paul means small. Interesting, huh? This big, important man. I don't know if he chose this name or somebody else picked it for him. But here's a man who truly learns humility. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he had to ask, who are you, Lord? He'd been put in his place. So here he's finally got this name of small. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit and fixed his gaze on Elimus, and he said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him. And he went out seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, be amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Not the teaching of Paul. But he saw something amazing here. Now, one of these texts, these texts are kind of, kind of interesting. It's, it's an amazing event, right? We saw something miraculous here. And isn't it interesting that this, more or less the same thing happened to Elimus that had happened to, to Saul back on that road? And he goes to blindness begins to realize that he's messing around with things. He's, he's competing with something that is way, way bigger than himself. And he's in over his head. We don't know what else happened to Elimus. We don't know. Hopefully he came to Christ too. That would be a nice ending to the story. We don't know the, the ending of that story. But we do know that Paul had had about enough of this guy perverting 
salvation. And he's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He's called a magician. So this guy's got things going in every angle he can think of. And he's managed to weasel his way into the very presence of Sergius Paulus, the most powerful man in the area. And God shuts him down. Shut him down. Now, what, I, I, what would be kind of fun for the application of this was go home and every time you see a false teacher, just pray this and they'll, they'll go blind and you know, bump into walls. And, you know. Wouldn't that be entertaining? I mean, that, how dazzling would that be, right? Well, mess with those guys, they'll, be, they'll go blind. So, <laughs> well, that's not really the application of this text. Would you agree? As important as that is. But these are the early days when the church is being established. And what God is doing is he's setting apart, he's making a distinction between the truth of the gospel and all the paganism and all the false teaching. And there was quite a bit of it even in those days. He's making a distinction between what God has to say and the truth and everything else so that the light is shining in the darkness. Remember when Jesus said, maybe, maybe you know this verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Keep going. No one comes to the Father but by me. If that is not a clear, a clear declaration that he is the Savior and the only Savior, I, I don't know what is. There is no other way to see that. That's exactly what Jesus meant. I am the Savior. There is no one else. Now, Jesus warned us, though, that there were, there, were, uh, there were going to be false teachers and there would be uh, false, false leaders and false theology and false beliefs. He warned us about this several times, but just a couple of examples. We did this when we were talking about Jesus' master class in, in Matthew 7, 15. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They're predators. They're not here to help you. They're here to consume you. But they may look like they're friendly. They may look like they're kind. In fact, Paul says that we shouldn't be surprised when Satan shows up as an angel of light, for such he was once. And we shouldn't be surprised that his servants appear to us as ministers of righteousness. And remember what righteousness means? Righteousness means being right with God and having a, a nature now that reaches out to others in love and mercy. It's not, it's not just about doing the right things and not doing the wrong things. It's not about behavior per se. It's really about character. A character that certainly produces good works. But righteousness is about being right with God. And so they appear as ministers of all of that. Oh, if you come with us, you'll be right with God. We've got the inside stuff. This is what you need to know. We've got this. Come, come with us. You'll be right with God and you'll be a better person. They don't come in, you know, dressed, dressed in red with little, little horns and a pitchfork. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't come in saying, I'm, I'm really going gonna, gonna to eat you alive. Your flesh is for me. And they don't do that. Jesus said, for false Christs, isn't that interesting? False messiahs, false saviors. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. So as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 13, you might want to keep your, your finger in Acts 13 and turn back to Deuteronomy 13. That's the fifth book of Moses. <clears throat> and he says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. This is a capital offense. Well, the Old Testament's bloody. The Old Testament's harsh. No, Let's keep going. Because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery 
to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from among you. Why is this so important? Because the way of salvation was being established through Israel on the earth. And through that, then, the Messiah would come. And so if that gets perverted, if that gets twisted, then everyone downstream that needs to hear the truth of salvation cannot hear it. So this person who brings in false teaching and lies is standing in the way of the life of the souls of everyone downstream from them. This is very, very important. So this thing about false teachers, this thing about false prophets and religions is a very important issue. And there's a few things I want to say about that. So if you get nothing else, I want you to get these two points, okay? Actually, it's a bunch of stuff I like to get, but you're only going to get these two points. First, all false teachers, all false religions, all false prophets have two things in common. They have two things in common. The first thing is they deny that Jesus is the one true God. Because there is salvation under in, in no one else. There is no other name under, under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And God himself is the one who saves us. And so they cannot embrace God as the one and only. They cannot embrace him, embrace him as the one and only Savior. They have to find some way to distort, to, to cloak, to hide, to break this down so that we don't really have a Savior in him. It has to come through something else, through themselves, through their falsehood. Follow me on this? So it has to be that way. It's logical. But we've known that Jesus is always God. Grab your Bible, if you will. I'm going to show a couple things about that. John chapter 1. Very familiar text. At least I hope so. John chapter 1. I think John chapter 1 is one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. All the way through verse 18. But we're just going to look at verse 3. 1 through 3. Where it says, in the beginning. What's that, what's that a reference to? Creation. Creation. In the beginning was the word. Now this is just, as you know, this is just a nickname for Jesus. It's the word logos, and it means, it, logos is, is a word that means the revelation or the explanation, the, the manifestation of something. And so this first chapter, he's called this by a, by a nickname. You know, John writes like a poet, and he's got this great way of putting it. So he packs all this stuff into simple words. But in the beginning was the word. That's Jesus. And listen to this. And the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, at that moment of creation, before anything had come into being, God. And Jesus is there because he is God. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Now I spent some time in, in, in Greek when I was in Bible school and that's exactly what that says. This is not a mistranslation or an interpretation. That is exactly what it says. It's a very simple, simple sentence. The word was God. Always was. Because there was nothing else in existence at the time. Now, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 2. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that, that has come into being. So Jesus Christ was, a, was the, the co-creator with the Father and with the Spirit. You know, Genesis 1, that, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says, and the Spirit of God was, was hovering over the, the deep. He was there too. He was a co-creator also. So take, all of the Trinity was involved in this creation. So Jesus didn't become God. Jesus isn't a, a, a created being who achieved deity somehow. He was always God. And this is where they try to pry us away. They try to pry us away from, from God, from Christ. Now, look at Philippians chapter 2. Well, we know Christ, when we think of Jesus, we, we, we think really of him as, as incarnated. We think of him as a, as, a, as a man, walking. Certainly he's a man, because he was always God. He is God and man at the same time. 
So we drop down to, in Philippians chapter 2, we'll pick up with verse 6. He's talking about Christ Jesus. You see that at the end of verse 5. Who, although he existed in the form of God, stop there. When, when Christ was existing in heaven, before he became a man, he was in the same form as the Father. No difference. And so although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, you know, clutching, it's mine, that kind of thing. Verse 7, but he emptied himself, taking the form of, bond, of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being formed in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the knee of Jesus every knee will bow. This is an act of worship. And God the Father set this up. With me on this? Every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what God the Father has done is set him up so that we know he is equal. But God also says he will not share his glory with another. But here he is doing it. Then Jesus is not another. Jesus is God and always was. So, we want to hold on to that. Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There has been no change. Nothing's changed. Now, all false teachers deny this. We've got a couple of examples here. Okay, we're not going to cover all of them, because if you've noticed, there are catalogs of people that we might, and organizations that we would consider false teachers, right? So, you probably don't really want to cover them all this morning, do you? No. Yeah, I didn't think we didn't have to answer quite so fast. So, all right, so let's start with one that's kind of well known. Islam. Islam says that Jesus was a prophet. They're willing to acknowledge that he was a prophet, but that he was just a human prophet, and that he's, he's lesser than Muhammad. And somehow what Muhammad said when he came along, um, set, it's, it superseded what Jesus had said. So then the prophets change? Their message change, really? Judaism rejects Messiah. They rejected Jesus as Messiah. And, so, and to some point, they, some, there are some that say that there really is never going to be a Messiah. It's just a figure of speech. Wow, okay. But they rejected him. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that he, is, he was actually originally a, uh, Michael the Archangel. And so he came down to be this savior for the world and so achieved deity. And when you look at their translation, they change John 1.1. 1, 1, mm -hmm. And they say that, that, he, that the word was with God, and the word is a God. They change it. So now they have two. Wait a minute, I thought there was just one. See, the theology starts doing these gymnastics because they're going to deny that Jesus Christ was God and became a man and never ceased being God at any time. In fact, there's a movement right now, you probably heard of this, this uh, uh, Bethel Church that's in, in Reading out here. They take this out of, out of Philippians. They write a lot of music, and there's a bunch of churches that are using their music. We need to be very careful what we sing. And their whole thing is that when, when Jesus emptied himself, he stopped being God. He was God, then he stopped being God. Then he was crucified, buried, and he raised again. He went and he ascended to heaven, became God again. I'm sorry, that's not that's not what the Bible says at all. By emptying himself, it doesn't mean he gave up his deity. But there are people that teach that. Now, they've got a lot of other quirky theology also. And so they really, they, they look like a church. But they have, they have separated who Jesus Christ is. They're denying the deity of Christ. So, um, Mormonism teaches that Jesus is one, one God of millions of God. He also started out as a, as a spirit child as a spirit being in his pre-mortal time, and he was fathered by God the Father, and, and God the Father has a wife. Did you know that? So he has, this, he has Jesus' mother, and that Satan is also his brother. And they had this, this rift between them of how they should, they should save the world. And so Satan, was, Satan said, well, they should follow my commandments and follow me, and Jesus says, no, I will save them. And so he was a created being after all, I guess. This is what they teach. 
But they don't have one God. They have millions of gods that, that populate the universe. And if you're, if you're good, if you follow the teachings and you, and you um, fit into the, the behavior that they want you to fit into, then you can become a god too. But that's not what scripture says. So we have this very clear rift. Very clear. It's, it's one or the other. It can't be both. We'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But in 1 John, look at this. In 1 John, little letter, past Hebrews, James, Peter. 1 John chapter 4. He says, Beloved, 1 John 4, 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, by that he means the incarnation, becoming a real man. God became a man. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. This is a very important thing. But yet there's so many Christians that don't seem to understand there is a really a difference between what we believe as, as biblical Christians, who are followers of Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior, and the rest of the religions and teaching out there. There's a survey done recently, um, and it came out that they, they looked at a number of the, the current big religions, and they found that evangelical Christians, that would be us, are the least informed about their own faith. That's really disappointing, isn't it? I mean, that, that's kind of embarrassing. That all these other religions and cults, they know more about their faith than we do. And yet we're the ones, we have the truth. This is the grace of truth. So, it's awfully picky, isn't it, Dave? And there's only, only one way. Don't, don't all roads lead to God? Is that what we're told all the time? Well, let's think about that a minute. Do all roads really lead to God? Well, first of all, what do you mean by God? See, the roads are different. And don't different roads take you to different places? So, yeah, they're different. In, in Eastern religion, in, in paganism, and in polytheism, that matter and space and time are everything. And all of the, the, the spiritual powers are just simply a part of that. Everything is made up of this huge cosmic putty. There is no real God. And so to say that Eastern religion and polytheism and paganism all take you to the same place simply isn't true. That is, that's not the same thing as what we're talking about here. The, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a, has a universe populated with thousands, perhaps millions of gods. All with planets and the saviors and all of this that's going on. That's a different universe. Fundamentally, it's not the same thing. Does that, does, does that make sense? Do you understand that? You've got one universe that's full of this cosmic putty and everything is made up of this cosmic putty. They call it pantheism. Everything is God. There is no such thing as a personality. There is no such thing really as time and space. It's all an illusion. But in this other universe, we have millions of gods. In another universe, we have one creator who exists outside of time, outside of space. He created all things together out of nothing by simply speaking a word. Those are three completely different existences. All roads cannot lead to God. They have different kinds of gods. They have a different universe. They don't lead to the same place. And this is part of what marks us out. This is part of what makes us a target of the darkness. This is why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were targets of the darkness. This is why Daniel was a target. Because they don't fit in with the rest of the world system. They don't sit in with, with the satanic priorities of submit to me. C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity, we cannot compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. How could we? We're dealing with facts. Of course you can be very simple if you have no facts to bother about. 
<laughs> the second thing is, the second thing, first, first is all false teachers deny Jesus. The second one is all false teachers demand a works-based salvation. Christianity is the only one that says you cannot earn your salvation. Others give that lip service. What they do is they, they, they talk about how, well, Christ or whatever their, their, their performance is in their, in their religion, their ritual, that gets you your foot in the door, but then you have to earn the rest of the way. Well, then you're not saving yourself because you're not saved yet. All false teachers assert that God does not save you. You have to save yourself. Now, however they do that, it may be complicated, it may be simple, but all insist that all men and women have to achieve their, by their own behavior, by their own obedience, or by some ritual, they have to achieve then this acceptance into some kind of higher existence, whatever that may be. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which is, see this one too. You know this one, don't you? You ought to. This one is key verses, everybody ought to know. For by grace you have been saved, by grace. Grace is a free gift, it is unearned. It is a free, free gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not even the faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not as, as a result of works, why? So that no one will boast. Because God is in this for his glory. There is no, no way to save ourselves. God has not allowed it. But even if, even if he had allowed it, how could we do that? There's nothing in this life, nothing that we haven't sullied with, with our sin. There isn't, there's nothing here we haven't contaminated. Everything in this universe, after Adam fell, has been stained. We have nothing clean to offer him. So how could we save ourselves? He had to save us. And so we're not saved by works. We're saved by simple, simple faith. And he gave that to us ourselves. So we're, so we're, not, we're not saving ourselves at all. Islam, I'm trying to be respectful. Because these are serious people. I, I want to throw this in here too real quick. We talk to people who are parts of different religions and they're parts of different cults. And they're not, they're not the ones that make this stuff up. They're the victims. They're the ones who've been taught things that simply aren't true. They're the ones that Jesus warned us about will be the victims of the false teachers. The Bar Jesuses, the Joseph Smith, the Mohammed, the Mary Baker Eddy. They come along, the Jim Jones. They come along and they victimize people. So we need to be very careful and very respectful and very kind when we talk to people who believe things differently than ourselves, they are sincere people and they are looking for something that, that is going to give them a better life. That motivation is not something we can carp at. So, but Islam has five pillars. They're supposed, to, they're supposed to earn their salvation too. And if they don't do these things, they haven't got a chance. But first, there's a, there's a profession of faith in Arabic. You have to say it in Arabic or it doesn't count. Okay? And it's, it's there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. You have to say this. That gets you in. So see, you're saved by faith. Not so fast. Then you have the, the five prayers every day. You have to do this consistently every day. You have to fast, and you have to pray in Arabic. And you have to fast during the month of Ramadan, which is usually April, May. They kind of, have different calendars, so it kind of bridges those two months. They have to have almsgiving. And once in their lifetime, if there's any way they can, they're able to do it, they have to do a pilgrimage to Mecca. And if they'll do all of that and, and live to be a good person, then they might escape the judgment. Catholicism requires that you be baptized by them. You have to go to confirmation. It means to embrace their theology. You have to go to mass, which is, a, which is interesting. It's a ritual re-sacrifice of Christ. Did you know that? It's not just a church service. It is a ritual resacrifice of Christ. And so they believe that when they give you communion, that you're actually taking into your body the actual blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. But they withhold the cup because that's what a life is. 
we were in Hungary, and one of the things that, that disturbed me a little bit was over the, the big churches, there's a big big church in, uh, it's called a basilica. It's a big church, it's like one step down from a cathedral. They have, they have ranks, do you know that? I guess some are better than others. And so over the door, it had these words inscribed uh, in Latin, it's, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It wasn't talking about Jesus. It was talking about the church, the organization. That you have to come to them to be saved. You don't go to Jesus, you go to them. They're the ones that hold this. So you see how they separated you from the Savior? So now they're in control. This is what false teaching does. But you have to, you have to go to, you have to be baptized, confirmation, you have to go to Mass. You have to take holy orders, which means either be, become a, a nun or a monk or a priest, or you have to get married. And then there's last rites. You have to go through last rites, where a priest pronounces basically a, a small mass over you and gives you blessings, and somehow that's, that's going to sort of seal the deal and then hopefully purge you of your last sins, because he's the one that has the power to do that. It's not the Savior at the cross. It's the church. And if all else fails, they have purgatory, where you have to suffer until you've suffered a long, a long enough. You see how you're saving yourself? You have to suffer long enough until they let you out, and then, then because you've had these other things in your life and your past, then you can go to heaven. See, God isn't saving you there. You're saving yourself. Every step of the way, you're saving yourself. In Hinduism, salvation is, is they're, they're, they don't really have heaven as we would understand it. Salvation is the escape of this endless cycle of death and rebirth. So it's not that you're really gaining something in particular, although there's this blissfulness that they talk about. It's not you're escaping something bad. That's kind of sad. But it requires one of three methods. Here's how they do it. Uh, it's the way of action, which is being a, a good person and doing good works. They have the way of knowledge that you have to comprehend, this is how they put it, you have to, I'm not making fun of this, I'm trying to be very respectful, but you have to comprehend the universe, according to their model, in total. How do you do that? Who's big enough to take in the universe, really, really comprehend it? It's completely out of reach, does this make sense? And so, the other is the way of devotion, where you pick out one of their three million gods and you serve that god with everything that you have. Still works. Then there's a royal way, the royal way they call it, which is a, a, a life of meditation and yoga. And so this is how all of these things function. They always have some kind of works that you have to do. They may give lip service to being saved by faith, but it's not. That's only the second chance that opens the door for you now to have all of these works. But Paul calls these things in Romans, he calls them dead works. We cannot earn our salvation. So all roads do not lead to God. The Bible says that we cannot save ourselves through good works. Look at Galatians, just to be clear. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Very clear. Galatians 2.16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, not justified, not declared innocent, not pardoned by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. There's nothing we can do, no matter how good we may try to be, that can save us. It is impossible. All roads do not lead to God. And false teachers, false teachers may be perhaps the most destructive force in all of history. We look at the 20th century and we look how, how many people died at the hands of socialism. Terrible tragedy. We look at, we look at the, the, the tens of thousands that have died from different diseases. But what has killed the most people? False teachers and false religion, by far. Because they come in under the radar as angels of light and ministers of righteousness. And how many people believe? In good faith, but they're being victims. 
the terrifying, terrifying thing. We have this grace of truth. We cannot perfect ourselves by our own works. In fact, Hebrews chapter 10 says that we have already been perfected once and for all. We cannot save ourselves. God had to perfect us, and he did. He made us perfect. How do you do that? I mean, do you? I look out here, and I, I don't see a lot of people that look all that perfect. I mean, you look, look really good to me. I love you all, but would you say you're perfect? See, theologically, that's really not true. You are. Because who you were in Adam, the moment you believed, who you were in Adam was taken out of you and thrown on the cross and crucified in Christ Jesus. So when he was buried, that was buried with him. But when he was raised, you were raised to newness of life. And it is the very life of Jesus Christ that you have in you now. That life is perfection. That life is why you're acceptable. Has nothing to do with how good you are. Has nothing to do with your performance. Has only to do with what he did for you. In the fullness of his mercy, in the amazing love and grace, he left nothing to chance. He made you perfectly acceptable on your worst day. Now with that perfection already implanted in you, now he seeks to make the outside of you conform to what the inside is, but that has nothing to do with your salvation. Case in point, the man on the cross next to Jesus, the thief, He's hanging there, nailed to a cross. He never gave. He never sang a hymn. He just said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. That's all it took. The simplest faith is all it took. And Jesus promised, you'll be with me today in paradise. I wonder how many people have come to Christ. Every time I think of this story, I've always thought this. How many people have come to Christ at that last minute because of that thief on the cross and the example God gave us through that man who couldn't even scratch his nose for him? The Bible describes God as a single essence with three persons. We've talked about, we've really talked about the Trinity. We've really talked about God as creator. But Jesus is creator. One more thing. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. This is cool. Hebrews chapter 1. Normally I want to, you know, we'll just throw as many verses past there as we can, but I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 1. So open your Bible or your picture of your Bible. Now, this is God the Father talking about Jesus the Son. Okay? Listen to what he says. Verse 8, he says, But of the Son, he says, that's God the Father, your throne, what's the next phrase? O oh God. God is calling Jesus God. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And, in, and you, Lord, in the beginning, now he's talking about his, his being creator. You, Lord, still talking about Jesus, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all become old like a garment, like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. God the Father describing the Son on equal terms as himself. We look at the grace of truth. The Bible says that there's only one Savior, God himself. Is your Bible warmed up yet? Is it kind of flexy? Is it easy to... <laughs> you got a few verses? Look at, look at a couple more. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah is about the middle of your Bible. Okay? Isaiah chapter 43. I want you to see this one. You find Jeremiah, you keep going left. 
Isaiah 43, verse 10. Let's just see this. This one really leaves no room for a number of the religions out there. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. What's the next phrase? Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. If there's only one, there will be no more. There is no chance that you, uh, by being good, that you end up becoming a god. And he says, he says that I am the Savior. There is no other Savior. Now turn to chap chapter 10 of John. Let's pick this one up too. John chapter 10. Now keep those two ideas from Isaiah in your head. John chapter 10. Picking up verse 24. Jesus is having a, a difficult conversation with some of the Jewish leaders. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Do you hear him saying he is the Savior? And I give eternal life to them. Now, eternal is not the same as infinite, is it? It has no beginning, and it has no end. How does he give that away? It's the kind of life he has himself. It had no beginning. It has no end. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you hear his power? My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Get the next line. I and the Father are one. Now, I don't often dip into the Greek, but I want you to look at this one. The word here for one means one, like the numeral one means one thing. But Greek has, has masculine, feminine, and neuter cases, okay, or, or genders, right? Now, when it's in the masculine, it means that we are like comrades. We are in this together. We are the team. We are, we are, we are one together, you know, like musketeers, right? When it's masculine. When it's feminine, is we're thinking the same kind of thing. Isn't that kind of funny? But when it's neuter, it's neither masculine nor feminine, it means it's the same object. So when you send someone to find something and they're not sure they got the right one, they call you back and they say, is this the right one? And, you would, and they would put that in the neuter. Is this the, right, is this the right object? Is this the right item? Have I got it right? Did I find the right one? This is it. This here, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, is neuter. God the Father and myself are the same item. It isn't some figure of speech. He's declaring himself to be God. And people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Oh, yes, he did. If this isn't clear, how they respond? The Jews picked up stones again to stone. Again, isn't that great? To stone him. Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. Of which are you stoning me? The Jews answered, not for good works. We do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. They got the message. He is God. He is the Savior. And no one can be snatched out of his hand. The Bible says we're saved by faith and faith alone. Because he does all the saving. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever, what? Believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting. everlasting life. There's that eternal thing again. It's this amazing compassion that he has. But notice there are no clauses, no asterisks, no ifs, no, well, you have to do this too, included in that verse. It's by simple faith and faith alone. John 5, 24, one of my favorite verses. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. It was passed out of death into life. There's nothing there but faith to save you. Simple faith and faith alone. And false teaching is always going to separate us from that. It's going to separate us from who Jesus is, and it's going to separate us from his, his ability, his, his willingness, his compassion to save us. Christians must be able to tell the difference between true and false teachers. And many of us can't, don't, or won't. But what position does that put people in who are the victims of false teachers? Who is left to tell them? First of all, we can become victims of very false and destructive teaching and end up in a place we really didn't want to end up in. By that I mean very confused, staining our ability to, to share the gospel with other people. We don't want to go there. So we have to learn our Bibles. We have to learn very well. You know, you know the old story about how do they, how do the, the, the Treasury Department, how do they teach people to recognize counterfeit? They, they have them with real money, and they feel it, and they do the exercise, they touch it, they touch it, they touch it, they touch it, and then they slip in a fake, a good fake. Because they're so used to it, they can, they can recognize it instantaneously. It doesn't feel the same. Wait a minute, it doesn't look the same. You have to know the truth. So you have to learn your Bible. In the grace of truth, Christians must be able to express the truth. Peter tells us we need to be able to give an answer for those who ask about what we believe. We don't always have to beat their door down and make them listen to us. That's usually rude and it doesn't tend to be very effective. But we have to be able not only to recognize false teachers, we have to be able to express the truth. We have to learn our Bibles. And we've got to do some stuff kind of like this and really think this through. How important is this? But it all comes down to this. The grace of truth. This is why Paul recognized that God was going to blind this man, this Elimus guy, this bar Jesus. Because in God's compassion, he was going to make sure the door was open for Sergius Paulus to be saved. And who knows how many people around him to be saved. It's the same compassion that Jesus has on the leper, on the woman at the well. The same compassion he had on me in 1975, watching Jerry Falwell on the te television. <laughs> I'm the only one I know <laughs> with, with that testimony. But it's that compassion that he wants you to be with him. It's that compassion that he took care of everything. He became to us everything we needed. Life and righteousness and hope and salvation and redemption. So that every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. The Lord. Romans 5a. God shows, he demonstrates. I love the old King James commends. I just like, here's, I want you to see this. I love that. For God commends his love for us and that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. What a savior. What love and compassion. That he made sure there were no interlopers, nobody in between, that he ensured by simple faith that he gave you too, you would be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the importance of this. There's so much that could be said, so much more that could be said. But we know that you have given us the truth, this amazing, mighty grace that we can know you we can know you crucified and raised again and know with confidence that it is consistent throughout all of history. You have never changed. That there is no one that can stand between us 
and if they try, they are from Satan. But I ask, Lord, that you will take this congregation and you will give them a fire in their heart that they will love your word, that they will love the Savior, and people will be drawn here, and people will find faith, and we will be able to help them become followers of Jesus Christ. Please snatch the people out of the, out of the fire and out of the lies so they can believe and be saved with simple childlike faith for the rest of their, their lives and on into eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.